Do you have a card, Joe? Because Fulch, a quick Camorra, I was Kelora, a quick of being the Rhine at Tiroliac, Don Shaw, and Oscar Manud. So as Fadon Torres, a customer on Kade Law, Hussig Paddy and Shaw, and Edi, a shock to him, Gideon Rhine Moore, a tog when you know. I was Tosulagum, a make Camorra, a runa, a ring, and Shaw and Nov. So hello to everybody and welcome to the celebration of 50 years of geography here in Minute. So it's my great pleasure to welcome here today friends, colleagues, former colleagues, former undergraduates and postgraduates, co uh, geography colleagues from around the world and Minute colleagues. So we've had over 150 people register for this event, so it's a, a wonderful showing. As a geography department, it's also fitting that we're welcoming people from north, south, east and west, from Oslo, Padova, Taiwan, British Columbia. And it's a pity that we can't all meet in person, but uh, this online platform does at least allow us to welcome friends from around the world. And potentially the roost wouldn't necessarily uh, manage to handle the stampede if we were all in person. <laughs> uh, we also remember here today people who are not with us, so including uh, Dr. Martin Charlton, who passed away earlier this year, and Matt Stevens, who passed away in 2018 during the first year of his PhD studies. So I'll shortly hand you over to Dr. Helen Shaw, our current head of department, and Professor Eva Leninen, president of the university, but just a little bit of housekeeping for me to start with. So this meeting is set up as a webinar, uh, so we can turn the camera and mic on and off for you if needed, but otherwise it's just for the, the panelists and chairs. If you have any questions, observations, put them in the chat and uh, the chairs will relay them if, uh, if that's a good idea. Um, we have a web page <coughs> as well, the link to which is in the chat called the Jamboard, where you can post past memories of being part of Minute Geography. We'll use the hashtag uh, MinuteGeog50, um, so you can do that for all of your TikToks and your Instagrams and your Twitters and whatever you're at on yourselves. We'll have a slideshow during the in in intermission, during the break, um, and so possibly as well at the end. So keep your eye out for any old pictures uh, that you and, and old colleagues that you might see there. So uh, no more for me for this stage. I'll hand you over to Dr. Helen Sean out for a brief welcome. Thanks, Gerard. Um, Yes, hi everyone. As a new head of department uh, in uh, the head of department post since September this year, and with just five years at Maynooth, I'm really humbled to be here providing this welcome um, to a department of friends and colleagues with such a history and to a new president with a wealth of experience across global universities. It's really amazing to see so many registered and Gerard said a little bit about who was registered. And on behalf of all geography colleagues, I really welcome you all to this 50th anniversary celebration event for Maynooth Geography. Maynooth Geography is a really special place. Past lecturers and heads and other colleagues worked hard to develop it as a leading department that has maintained its status over decades. Some I've met personally, so Proncheus, I owe special thanks to as one of the people who really welcomed me to the department when I arrived and also helped me to plan my first week-long geography field trip, which I had to do within three months of my arrival. Um, I really look forward to the end of the pandemic and a dinner and a chat in the roost, Pontreas. Um, John Sweeney, Sheila Waddington, Paul Gibson were all still very much around when I arrived and have made amazing contributions, as well as making me feel welcome. And Jang Ripley, of course, was head of department when I was recruited and has also been supportive. And as Gerard said, we all remember Martin Charlton, who, Charlton, whose warmth and wicked humour touched us all over the years. Others such as Paddy Duffy and Jim Walsh, I've only met briefly, but each time their enthusiasm for their department has been obvious, along with their valuable regional and historical perspectives that they brought to research in geography. And of course, many current geography colleagues make the geography department special too, but I'm not going to mention them all, it would take too long. Um, many others from the past I've not met and I really hope that will change and I know a lot of them are here and I'm sorry that we really can't meet in person today and I hope at some point we will be able to meet and I look forward to hearing stories about the past. And of course, no university is an island. Each relies on peer review and collaboration. And here today are past and present external examiners and colleagues from many other departments, universities and countries to whom we're really grateful for con collegiate contributions. So welcome to all of you. And thanks for, to all of the organizing group for this conference and the panelists for all their contributions later. 
The department is really special, but so is geography. Geography is distinctive because it is many disciplines. And as universities separated into disciplines, geographies maintained this sort of stalwart multidisciplinary position in a sea of specialisms. Of course, it's hard sometimes to see where we are in geography and it reinvents itself every now and again. It's hard to sometimes see what geography is. But I think the overriding sense of ourselves is linking and understanding human environment interactions and all the complexities of impacts, feedbacks and influences is key here. Although seen by some geographers as old fashioned, this environment human concept still provides a centrality to our focus. So I really look forward to those discussions about geography and Maynooth geography, learning about the past, hearing about the present and debating the future as we go through the panel sessions today. In addition to this event being a celebration, it's an opportunity to reflect on geography and it's a valuable one. And I'll be really interested to see what the panels discuss about the future of our subject area. <clears throat> I think it's really important that we see that there's a huge link with sustainability and, and environment, which is perhaps underexploited. The environment nourishes us physically and mentally in ways that we've only just begun to understand over the last decade or so. And we have to continue to navigate dichotomies in the discussions of our future, balancing the role of technical fixes and nature-based solutions and striving for a planet and planning for a mess, more just and resilient society and a resilient environment. So I think that's re a really important focus of geography and one that um, I hope to see the future bring personally. Um, so I really look forward to these discussions. I think they're going to be really important as well as celebratory. And I also extend a really warm welcome to our president, Professor Eva Lennon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. And I can see in the chat already that uh, Sheila is correcting you that uh, she welcomed you to Minute on the 2nd of January, wondering what you were there. Oh, Sheila, you <laughs> did. You're right. I arrived on the 2nd of January to an empty department in 2017 and Sheila was there. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, and uh, without further ado, as Helen was saying, it gives us a great pleasure that we're joined by the president of Minute University, Professor Eva Linnan. And I'll hand over to you now, Professor, to um, uh, to say a few introductory remarks. Um, thank you very much indeed, and, and congratulations, uh, Geography Department, on this uh, important birthday. 50 years is an important milestone for a department as it is for human beings. So I'm uh, Eva Leinonen, um, President of Maynooth University since 1st of October. So unfortunately, I don't have a, a long history with uh, Maynooth uh, geography to, to draw upon, but I do look forward to uh, hearing some more um, reflections uh, on the time 50 years at uh, Maynooth University Geography Department. Um, so 1971 was when uh, the first appointment was made at Maynooth uh, in geography. And I understand it was um, somebody called Paddy Duffy who's we have already made reference to. And it is from those sort of very humble beginnings that the department has grown into a very vibrant, as Helen said, multidisciplinary, internationally renowned department. And uh, from that first appointment, uh, the faculty is now over 20 members and uh, also has associated uh, members at the uh, Social Sciences Institute and also 21 postdoc researchers and 23 PhD researchers. That's a very vibrant geography department, I think on anybody's standards. So congratulations on that growth and vibrancy over a 50 year period. And in that period, uh, um, there has been also over 7,000 undergraduate students who have uh, graduated with a degree in geography at Maynooth and uh, 73 PhD students. So, and, and one really wonderful uh, feature of the geography department for me is that, um, you know, many of those graduates are still with us. Uh, you know, we have faculty members like Professor Connor Murphy or Adrian Kavanagh, Martina Roche, uh, Rowan Feely, and they all completed their PhDs at the department. So it's always a very good sign, isn't it? When people actually want to stay on 
and they feel they've been well supported through their studies and they want to be part of making a difference into the future. Um, undergraduate study, of course, as, as is postgraduate study, very important in geography. And, you know, as Helen said, is one of those um, very wide reaching, re reaching and ranging disciplines. Um, and we, we recently, I had a visit to the geography department virtually, and we discussed the fact that, you know, there's so many uh, links and opportunities for uh, connections with so many different disciplines, but also, importantly, key challenges that we are facing in the world. And geography is a really important contributor for us trying to solve those, those challenges. Just wanted to um, uh, highlight something, which is that uh, there's a, recently we've added a new degree to the uh, geography department, which is the BSc in biology and geography, and that obviously is with the Department of Biology. Um, it's an internationally renowned department, and um, there's different ways that we measure these sort of uh, uh, accolades. And of course, one way of looking at it is through rankings and um, uh, our ge geography department is one of three in Ireland that is in the top um, 200 in the QS world rankings. That's top 1%. That's a, a great achievement for a department, um, uh, any department. And, and, and a, that's also a reflection of the international um, collaboration projects that we have. Uh, we have very prestigious European grants, for instance, and of course, grants through the um, Iris Research Council and SFI. So, um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's something truly to be proud of, you know, and I know also that your students are very proud of you, uh, past students and future students um, and current students, and they do find themselves very well prepared for the world um, outside university, for world of work, the skills one learns in geography, are transferable to so much more than the fields that might be obvious that one would go to to work in. So, uh, you know, uh, that's what education is about: preparing students for life and and world um, beyond uh, the university. Um, I feel as a new president, I'm really standing on the shoulders of past presidents and past leaders. And um, I do understand that two of uh, former faculty members um, have been at top levels of university governance here at Maynooth, Seamus Smythe, who became president of St. Patrick's College and the first president at Maynooth University, and also Jim Walsh, uh, who became a vice president. Um, and of course, um, uh, the department is really a very central to uh, the geography universe, if I call it, in the university. And, you know, part of the um, climate analysis and research unit, as I said, Social Sciences Research Institute, National Center for Geocomputation, and I could go on. So, you know, you are everywhere, quite rightly so, because of the centrality of your discipline. And, and I, I congratulate you for being good university citizens and being part of these various um, activities that are important for the university. So I guess it simply um, remains for me to say from humble beginnings, you have blossomed into one of Irish and Ireland's leading academic departments. Um, I thank you for your uh, contribution to the university thus far. And I personally very much look forward to supporting the geography department and working with yourselves when we start to refresh our strategic plan in the new year. And uh, I hope that uh, you will uh, have every success in the next 50 years. So congratulations, enjoy this uh, celebration. Um, I personally, unfortunately, have to at least pop out for a period of time, and I will see whether I can come in back to the panel and to uh, this celebration towards the end of the afternoon. Um, have, a, have a good afternoon. Enjoy today. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Professor Lennon. Um, so I will shortly hand over to Rob to begin, Rob Kitchen, to, Professor Rob Kitchen, to begin the um, begin the the panel discussions. It is worth saying before we begin that 
the list of people that we want to speak today is far longer than we could accommodate. So, so please do interact with us on the chat, on the Jamboard, on Twitter. And at the end of this, if you, if you sort of stick around until half past four, we'll uh, raise a glass to Minute Geography to finish over. So uh, thank you very much uh, to, uh, to Dr. Helen Shaw and to Professor Eva Lennonen. And uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to uh, Professor Rob Kitchen to start the first panel. That's great. Thanks, Jared and um, Helen and Eva for, for, for the introductions. Uh, so I'm going to kind of do the next hour as, a, as, as chair, and there'll be two panels. The first one, uh, kind of really looking back at, kind of, I guess, kind of history of the department and up to the present. And then the second panel, really looking at the kind of uh, experiences of some of our uh, memories of some of our uh, graduates uh, from the department. Uh, I joined the department in 1998, along uh, not long after Roe did, and um, I guess I was part of the kind of the initial bridge from the original uh, members uh, to the present uh, period. So it was kind of a period of transition, really. We were just moving from St. Patrick's College into Maynooth University. Uh, in fact, I was the, myself and Brian from Irish were the last two uh, people appointed by the bishops uh, in, in the university um, to a new period where we started a new PhD programme. So we were starting to get graduates in the departments uh, and there was a, an opening up of research funding in the country and we were just starting on that road and NURSA started not too long afterwards and Icarus uh, just a couple of years later. So I think John started Icarus in around 2003. Um, and we started to grow in staff and we started to grow in, in student numbers for a, for a, for a second time. Um, so without further ado, I'm just going to, I'm just going to pass it really over to the, to the three panelists. We have three uh, speakers in this first panel. Uh, Professor Pat, uh, Patrick Duffy, um, who founded the department way back in 1971 and retired in 2010. Uh, Professor John Sweeney, who was the first physical geography lecturer in the department, uh, founded Icarus, in a, as we said, in around 2003, and uh, retired in 2013. And then Dr. Roe Charton, who is the current uh, longest serving member of the department, who joined in 1996. So I'm going to give each person around six or seven minutes to share their kind of thoughts and memories. Uh, and then we might take some questions if we've, if we've got time. So I'm going to pass it over to Paddy to make a start. Thank you very much, Rob. And um, I'm delighted to be here and unfortunately not face to face. And I'd like to just before I start, I'd like to wish well President Lennon and, and uh, indeed uh, Helen as well as, as head of department. Um, I suppose I was kind of trying to think of what I would say, but, but mainly, I mean, my role, I suppose, is mainly to uh, uh, embark on some granddad reminiscences of the start of the department, you know, uh, for the first 10 years, um, because the contrast between the department now and its sophisticated web, web uh, uh, sites and so on, the contrast is just enormous. So I'm going to sound like granddad talking about the bad old days when, do you remember when we had no shoes on our feet and so on and tough times we had and now look at all you guys and living in, in luxury in the 21st century. But um, yeah, I mean, start and before I say, I'm going to talk, I think I'm going to really reminisce about the first 10 or so years because uh, I, I'm, you know, having been accidentally appointed first in 1971, I mean, and then I was followed very quickly by n numbers of others, and I just list them for the for the record. Uh, by Prunchies Brannock, he was then called Francis Walsh at the beginning, but he's now Prunchies Brannock. Uh, then I that, that was he was followed by uh, let me think William Willie Smith, who subsequently moved to Cork UCC. Uh, then he was followed by Dennis Pringle. Uh, and then let me see, I don't want to leave anybody out. Uh, then Dennis Pringle, yes, and then John Sweeney and Seamus Smith. Okay, I've dropped all your academic titles for the purpose of this, uh, this reminiscence. So I'm speaking really, I suppose, on behalf of all of those who came in the first 10 years and what it was like during the first 10 years. And I'll just say, the first thing I would like to say is, uh, again, looking at the, the photograph of the campus, uh, it was but the old campus, the South Campus, as, as it's called now, uh, 
that was pretty much it's pretty much unchanged for about 200 years and it was much like that when i arrived first from the, from the concrete wastes of belfield and the first thing that struck me was the friendliness of everybody on the campus. It was a much smaller university that, college then, of course. I mean, there were probably less than a thousand students in total. In fact, there were so, it was so small that I think one of the first or second presidents that I experienced, uh, Thomas O'Fee, uh, subsequently Cardinal O'Fee, uh, I think he knew everybody by first name. He was a great person for remembering names and he could remember students that he met across Joe Square by name. Uh, so that was quite an achievement. But I remember the friendliness of everybody saying hello to me. I came from Belfield UCD and it was uh, nobody looked at you. You walked past and people looked straight ahead, just like any, any big city. But in Maynooth, everybody said, how's it going? How are you? Hello, good morning, etc., etc." I found this a bit, bit off-putting at the beginning, but then uh, I think that kind of friendly spirit uh, has stuck with the place uh, all the years down, down the years since then. The other, the other thing is, continuing on my granddad reflections, I mean, we, we started off then the first few years uh, very, very poorly off for resources and so on. So, I mean, I, I won't even dare tell you how barefooted we were in those days. I mean, we had very little, uh, I mean, for the first two years, two or three years, we, uh, the staff shared one telephone in Newhouse. Uh, and, um, you know, that was the kind of poverty that we had to, we had to go through. The library, which would have been one of the central, import, most important features in the university then, uh, and today as well, although maybe not as much today because everything is online today, but in those that we had no library really. So I, when I started in October 71, there was nothing. There was a library in the old uh, gun library, it was called, which is now the Russell Library. That was the main library in the college. And there was a geography section there, I remember, but most of the books, all of the books were 19th century holdings, including one massive uh, geological survey of India and a whole lot of stuff about travels and Africa and so on, uh, donations made by various parish priests around the place. So clearly the, the, the connection with the seminary and the Pontifical University of St. Patrick's College <coughs> pretty, was fundamental. So we were, geography was the first kind of Philistine stroke secular uh, department coming in with a completely uh, uh, secular staff, no connection with the clerical stroke uh, religious uh, staff on the pre on the pre-existing department. So all of the other departments in the Faculty of Arts and uh, and Social Science uh, were all headed by religious by priests essentially who were teaching in the seminary and residents residential staff in the, in the in the in the campus. So we come in as blow-ins uh, with with all sorts of uh, you know uh, radical ideas and so on. And I'm particularly thinking of this person who came after me, Pruncius Branagh, uh, who came in at the time he was uh, heading up a big resource, resource protection campaign in Ireland to, uh, to uh, try and protect the mining resources in Ireland at the time. So he was kind of, and he was coming from Simon Fraser University as well uh, for, as a graduate student there. So he was coming with very radical ideas and, and critical ideas about the situation in, in Ireland and in Maynooth. But, the big challenge for us at the, for the first 10 years really was to uh, try and establish a separate identity from the ecclesiastical uh, religious seminarist, seminarist identity. All the other departments, as I said, were, were, were essentially part of the old tradition, which had been there for 200 years, uh, where, where so Holy Days kind of dictated the, the, the format of the term and semesters. So we had to, geography had to try and resist being gobbled up by the, by the, by the ecclesiastical uh, culture of the place. So we were, because when our students were out on field trips during the, 19, during the 1970s and into the 80s, I mean, most of the, if there were students were doing surveys in the west of Ireland or in, 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 in Ulster or somewhere, everybody said, oh, Maynooth, Maynooth, that's where the priests come from. So we had to, we had to counter that image and say, well, we're not, uh, we're not uh, clergy or clerical students and so on. That was important. Uh, so poverty of resources, uh, uh, a very poor library for the beginning, but we rapidly built up uh, the library background and so on, and that improved as the staff, uh, as the staff expanded. Uh, the other thing was because we were 
uh, not only a, a kind of secular Philistine intrusion in the place, we also, geography also had uh, costs and so on, which were greater than, I think the, the powers that be and the, and the powers that were in the universe and the college then expect, just thought this is another arts humanities department. It's very cheap to run and so on, but we had to rapidly disabuse them of this notion by, uh, by, by putting in uh, claims for funding for maps, for, uh, you know, photographic equipment, for all sorts of technical equipment that other departments in the humanities and arts didn't really require. And of course, we also had to put in, we were also anxious to emphasize our distinction by having field work and students going on field trips and field expeditions and so on. And that this was costly as well. We needed funding to assist with, you know, rent, hiring coaches and booking accommodation and so on and so forth. So that was important for all of us. Um, sorry, Paddy. Sorry, Paddy. I, I, I'd listen to you all day, to be honest. but. Yeah. If you just want to kind of wrap up and I can pass it over to okay. Joe. Well, that's basically it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious, Rob, that, that, that I might have been... Uh, basically, that's it. We, we had to, uh, you know, resist the, the being gobbled up by the, by, the, by the religious culture of the place. And we had to... And we established a strong esprit de corps, and I think that's continued out to the present, thankfully. OK. Brilliant. Thanks very, thanks very much, Paddy. Sorry, John, do you, want to, do you want to take over the reins? Yeah, well, I think Paddy has described very well the, the early days of the department. And uh, my own recollection is very similar uh, to what he, what he has as well. I mean, I, I was the fourth appointment, if you like. And up until that point, physical geography had been more or less taught on a buy-in basis of individual courses. And uh, like most departments in the country at that stage, geography had been largely dominated by historical geographers, um, mainly emanating from, from the T. Jones Hughes School in UCD. So I think the time I came, all of the departments in the NUI were headed up by historical geographers, uh, and we had two even uh, among the five of us in Maynooth as well. So it was a slow process to, to get physical geography going. And I, uh, you also had to be very flexible. And I remember Paddy writing to me after I was appointed. Uh, I'd asked him, what do you want me to teach Paddy? And he said, well, I want you to teach geomorphology, climatology, biogeography, and human impact on the environment. And uh, that took me uh, by surprise a little because it meant that you had to become a jack of all trades very quickly uh, in, in all of those areas, some of which I hadn't a great deal of familiarity with. Um, so as Paddy was describing, um, the only building on the North Campus at that stage was the Arts Block, and we used to have to carry our uh, slide projectors and slides and extension leads uh, all the way over. Um, and uh, it, it was quite an ordeal in some ways, but it, it, it's worth remembering that Maynooth itself was a very different town in those days. The population of Maynooth in, in 1971, when Paddy took office, if you like, uh, was 1,300 people. So if you imagine contemporary Maynooth reduced by 90%, you'll get the idea of a small country town where even then the population of the seminary dwarfed uh, or was roughly the same rather as the entire population of the town, just as it is in many respects today with 14,000 uh, inhabitants as well. So there was, as, as Paddy was saying, quite, uh, quite basic facilities. The staff that had been appointed and, and were appointed all had very common links, surprisingly, with Canada. And um, the department, um, both um, all five of the department, rather, uh, either were graduates or spent sabbatical years in Canada as well. And, and the library, which Paddy referred to when it was eventually rebuilt, um, was a, a Canadian repository library uh, because of that. The, the old library was a bit of a I suppose, a, a character in some ways. Um, the librarian's classification system was rather sort of, uh, I suppose, subjective. And uh, the librarian tended to know the books and geography by the color of the covers as much as by the classification codes that they had. And uh, geography books, as Paddy said, were quite scarce. And there was a problem for a long time of students hiding geography books that were valuable elsewhere in the library. Uh, most commonly in the section for the German department because German and geography were clashed on the timetable and there were quite safe hiding books there. 
It was also a time when the numbers were growing and, and Paddy um, developed the numbers quite significantly up to about 200. Um, and uh, there was a very strict segregation after the end of first year between what were called general students and honour students. And only a small elite actually made it to the honour stream. There was one year, I recall, when there was only nine honour students and perhaps something like 50 or 60 general students in third year. Uh, that had its, its advantages because you could always give individual tuition to students over the summer doing their thesis um, as well. So it, it had some positive aspects. But the 1980s were really harsh years. Uh, not just in Maynooth, but for the country as a whole, stagnation, high and high immigration characterised those those years, uh, and um, uh, in particular the closure of Carysford College um, in in 1988 um, was quite a significant event because it made Maynooth the next smallest university or third level institution and made it quite vulnerable, and it was a, a definite strategic objective to try and increase numbers. The staff in Carysford were redeployed throughout the third level sector and geography, uh, geography received Jim Walsh, who later became head of the department uh, in, in the university and replaced um, Seamus Smith, who, as was said already, became master and then subsequently president of the new university. As the years wore on, Paul Gibson was appointed. Uh, in geomorphology and then later on row and this freed me up a little to try and focus a little more uh, on climate. Paul of course introduced as well a very successful HDIP master's course in remote sensing at GIS together with Dennis Pringle who was an acknowledged expert in those days and a pioneer of, of GIS techniques and they attracted high caliber students uh, all the way through to the mid 1990s, especially and, and even beyond. The department was also making a very big contribution professionally by the mid 1990s um, in the Geographical Society of Ireland, um, where many of the senior positions had been occupied by members of the department. The two geography journals, uh, Irish Geography and Geography Viewpoint, were both edited uh, in the department as well, and staff were very prominent on national committees and, and even on international committees at that stage. Uh, the students listening will probably be most interested in the, in the fieldwork antics that uh, they themselves got up to over the, the various years because they were in many ways the highlights of, of many undergraduate programmes with field trips to Germany, France, Scotland and many other places. And uh, I do recall the bicentenary of the university, uh, the, the, the Pontifical University Seminary, even um, that part of it which we were associated with in 1995, where we had um, a hoedown uh, on the college farm, complete with uh, barn dancing uh, and uh, a mechanical bucking bronco uh, for the staff to try out as well. So those were kind of strange years in many ways. Um, and then of course, shortly afterwards, the university became an independent entity uh, and achieved university status. What was surprising to me for many of those years was that we never had any PhD students. And the logic there was that, you know, after you've been through three years with a department of five, uh, you really had extracted almost all you could from your mentors. And also, of course, there was no real supports for, uh, for PhD students. So while we had successful master's programs and HDIP programs, uh, it was not really until um, the turn of the millennium that we graduated our first PhD student, Seamus Lafferty. And um, thereafter then things took off with, uh, in my case, EPA grants coming, becoming available for, uh, for research. And Icarus then grew very quickly uh, because we were well positioned in Ireland with a track record in climate in particular to avail of those new opportunities uh, which were emerging. So with the support of, of people like Mark and people like Jan Rigby, who is also online today, um, Icarus grew very quickly to, to reach uh, around 16 uh, research students uh, and postdocs. Um, there was a debate whether we should uh, achieve institute status or go for institute status at that point or not. Uh, but I was always 
of the opinion that we should stay within the Department of Geography because it gave us more independence uh, to do what we wanted to do. And uh, it would have diluted us to some extent, I felt, to, to join in, in an institute. So uh, the rest is history in many ways. Um, I'm really comforted to see the way that uh, Icarus has now grown and expanded so well under the, under the leadership of Peter Thorne. Um, and also, of course, that we are now recognized uh, as, as an important university uh, in terms of geography and in terms of climate change nationally. But those early days were the, the building bricks. And you know, my colleagues, uh, Paddy, Dennis, Seamus Smith, Fran Walsh, Sheila. Uh, Sheila, who came uh, to us um, from a, a, a senior position in, in second, secondary schools in England, uh, was very influential in running our practical classes. All right, John, and I'm going to have to get yeah, you to okay. wind up as well, I'm afraid. Uh, I'll just finish with excellent uh, cartographers and secretaries helping us all the way through as well. So that, that's my story. And uh, I think it's uh, an important early days development story to, to, to relate. Thanks. Brilliant. That's, that's great, John. Thanks very much and really comprehensive coverage. And amazing that you kept physical geography going by yourself for the guts of 13 years before uh, Paul joined you and then, and then Rao. Um, I'm really great now that physical geography is kind of on par with human in terms of the numbers of staff or pretty pretty close. Uh, so I'm going to pass you on to pass you on to Rao, who who helped grow the physical geography, I guess, over the last uh, kind of 20 whatever years you've been here now, almost 25, I guess. Yes, 25 years ago. So um, oh, 25 years ago. So halfway through the department's 50 year life so far. And there have been so many changes in that time, and it's it's going to be impossible to mention everything and everybody. And if I miss anybody out um, or something really important, um, that is an oversight on my part, but completely unintentional. So um, my arrival in the department caused the age and the gender profile to shift significantly. Um, so at the time, Jim Walsh was head of department. Um, so there were there was Paddy Duffy and Dennis Pringle and Francis Brunach and John Sweeney, Paul Gibson and Brendan Bartley, um, and also Sheila Waddington. Um, and then there was uh, Mary Weld was in the the um, administrator and one cartographer, Jim Keenan. Um, and uh, so Jim Walsh um, became vice president of the university in 2005. So he was followed as head of department by Dennis Pringle and to, until 2007. Then Mark Boyle for five years, Jan Rigby for four or five years, um, Jerry Cairns and now Helen Shaw, who is acting head this year. Um, so yeah, the next appointment was Rob. Um, and then more colleagues followed. So Ronan, Ronan Foley, Mary Gilmartin, Steve McCarran, Adrian Kavanagh, Sinead Kelly, Alistair Fraser in the mid 2000s, um, and also Chris Van Egerat, um, Rowan Feely and Connor Murphy, um, who was the first to do the entire journey from undergrad. And uh, now he's a professor. So he's the first to become a professor um, out of the um, PhDs in Maynooth. And then um, in the early 2010s, um, we were joined by Jerry Cairns, Karen Till, um, and Brendan Gleeson. There was a big mass exodus of retirements at this stage. So there were really big changes in the department. And those retirements um, were, many of them were brought, brought forward because of the crash and um, sort of redundant, I mean, not redundancy, um, retirement um, sort of incentives. Um, so then the mid to late 2010s, Peter Thorne, Jared McCarthy, Helen Shaw, um, Kath Brown, and then 2020s, Patrick Brezhnev and Lisa Orm. Many contract staff have also worked in the department, um, many of whom have gone on to lectureships in other departments um, or, or elsewhere. Um, we've always had, uh, um, we could always do with more admin support. Our administrators have managed heroically um, given the workload that they've had to deal with. So um, Gay Murphy joined Mary Weld um, 
in the geography admin office, um, both of them retired in that sort of mass exodus of the early 2010s. Um, Nessa Hogan, um, our, our uh, outstanding administrator, um, has also worked with Jennifer Lloyd Hughes, Una Holton and Norma Murphy. Um, and we were joined in um, the mid 2000s, I think it was by Mick Bolger, who is our computer technician. And um, it's sort of been pointed out that it's only four permanent people um, who've ever left. So um, before my time, Willie Smith went to Cork in the 70s, um, Brendan Gleeson, Mark Boyle, but he came back again, and, um, and then Kath Brown. Um, so undergraduates, in 1996, there were 459 undergrads. Um, this showed a steady increase over the years, but there was this massive increase in 2008 to 9, when the numbers went up to um, 1,077 undergrads, and the first year class was 515 students and had to be split and double taught by everyone who delivered the first year program. Um, by 2012, this had de decreased again below 1,000 undergrads. Um, but during this expansion and subsequently, we haven't been able to offer the same fieldwork opportunities that existed prior to this. Um, our single honours programme started in 2000. Um, and then re more, more recently, the BSc in Biological and Geographical Sciences um, we, we had uh, been sort of promised the possibility of um, moving into the science faculty and recruiting students from there for many years. So it's, it's finally happened with the first, first cohort starting in 2020. Um, there have been lots of new program developments University-wide, massive changes in technology. Um, I too had to carry the slide projector in its massive heavy box over to the other side of the campus and it was all overhead projectors. So things have really, really moved on there. Um, we've seen changes in the curriculum, um, moving from different subjects and um, sort of uh, more recently, new departments like law, business, psychology, um, which have impacted um, significantly on geography numbers and also the loss of geography as a compulsory subject from the junior cycle at second level. Um, Post-grad numbers, um, at the time I joined, um, there were um, different programmes which have been started up quite recently. So there was um, an MA in Geographic Analysis, um, the HDIP in Remote Sensing that's been mentioned, um, and GIS, um, and then the um, award-winning MSc in climate change started in 2008, um, and then the MSc in GIS and remote sensing, a re revamped program 2010, the MA in human geography in 2014, although there, had, um, there was uh, also a program in society and space um, in, the, in NERSA, which the geography department was involved in. Um, and um, more, most recently, um, Spatial Justice, which uh, started in 2019. The PhD programme was very new. Um, and um, when I started, there were five PhD students in the department. And um, I knew Seamus Lafferty, um, who got his PhD in 2000, I think it was. Um, now, the number of PhD graduates is something like um, 76 or more um, and uh, there's been developments to the PhD program um, with a, a postgrad training consortium that was started up by Rob Kitchen um, and then more formally the, the graduate um, education program um, which started in September 2010. Um, huge increase in the media profile, um, the research income um, is, is in the tens of millions, um, a really in, big increase in our um, visual profile. So lots of um, civic engagement, working with communities and NGOs and state agencies and government on policy work. Um, I'm very aware that uh, my time is now up, um, but I just wanted to mention that uh, there are also many geographers elsewhere in the, in, in the university. So, um, 
as well as the department, we have ICRIS, NERSA, the National Center for Geocomputation, and Aero and ICLRD, and uh, NERSA, of course, which was started by Rob Kitchen, and um, Mussi. And um, NERSA and Mussi probably wouldn't have it, uh, um, been able to exist without geography. Geographers have had a really big input there. So massive changes in those 25 years. Great, bro. Sorry, I'm, I'm aware we're kind of a couple of minutes uh, over time. And so it's going to be difficult to do the questions. What I'm proposing to do is we just move over into the next session and then maybe try and bundle up some questions at the end if, there's, if, if we don't run over that session as, session as well. Um, and uh, I'll just correct one small thing is, is I, I didn't start NERSA. <laughs> uh, Jim, Jim, Jim Walsh was probably uh, the, the architect of that with others in the, in the faculty. I, he, I, he was, I'm really sorry. Yeah, yeah, I just took it, I just took it over and uh, ran it for a few years. Okay, great. So I, I guess I just move on to the next, on to the next session, which is really to welcome back some of our former uh, uh, students who've uh, kind of gone on to other things, some of whom are still uh, in the university. So if uh, Steph and uh, Karen, Derek and Connor, you want to turn your uh, your, your cameras off, uh, on, sorry, um, we'll, we'll make a start of this session. So we're, we're joined by uh, uh, four people here, uh, Dr. Karen Keevney, who is in the School of Agriculture and Food Sciences at UCD, uh, did a PhD with us and uh, a little bit working in planning and then up to Queens and then back, back down to Dublin. Um, uh, Steph, who uh, Steph, uh, Dr. Stephanie Keo, who's now working on the uh, Train AI project over in NCG and has been kind of in, in NCG and Icarus uh, as post PhD. Uh, Professor Derek uh, McCormack, who's in the School of Geography and Environment in the uh, University of Oxford, who did his undergraduate uh, degree with us. And then uh, Professor Connor Murphy, as Rose said, who's kind of gone all the way through in, uh, in geography and uh, never left. Um, so entirely, entirely captured by the departments. Uh, so we're just going to kind of run in that order. So if we start with uh, Karen, if I can try and keep you to time, that would be that would be great. Okay, thanks. I'll try. Um, I will try to be brief because it would be nice to get some questions in, and it's lovely. We can see the all the attendees, and it's really nice to see some names of people I haven't seen in a long time. Um, so. Thanks very much for asking me to attend today. Uh, I was really looking forward to being in the news, but it is, this is a lovely second best anyway, and great to see some faces and names. I was in the geography department, or I joined the geography department in 2002, and it was a very exciting time really, and I think that's reflected in much of what it wrote, it had a fantastic timeline there. I had done my undergraduate in Galway, uh, one of the last to do human and physical geography there. And then I had gone on and trained as a planner in UCD. So I came to Maynooth not knowing anyone, not really knowing a lot about Maynooth. And now I can't imagine my life without Maynooth in it. Um, I, was only, I only ended up spending three years full time in Maynooth, um, but it was a massively influential time. It was a very exciting time to be a planner <laughs> in Ireland, would you believe? Uh, the National Spatial Strategy had just been adopted and a lot of the research had, the reports and background research had been carried out by the Geography Department and other colleagues. And so that's kind of the first thing I wanted to talk about was that idea of coming to Maynooth as a PhD student and really forming strong connections both within the department and the university and outside into the, the sort of the policy and societal world that we were we were living in. My own research, I, I, I'm very, very proud to be a rural geographer, and it was a very strong time for rural geography in the department. And Maynooth was very, very influential in rural policy. My supervisors were Jim Walsh and Paddy Duffy. And there was a group of us in particular. Brendan O'Keefe, Joanne Gallagher and Caroline Crowley. We started the Spatial Analysis Lab, which I don't know if it's actually still there on the ground floor of Rhetoric House. Um, we were the first residents in there together with Brian Conway and later Mary Kelly. And we were our next door neighbor was Jim Keenan. And even that base there 
it was such a lovely base because we'd knock on Jim's door, go for a cup of tea. Uh, Jim was a great source of information for anything that was going on around the place. So if we wanted to hear any um, uh, gossip slash important information, we would we'd knock on Jim's door and have a chat. Um, what I remember as well is at that time, it was 2002, as far as I know, the number of PhDs that started that September was nine, which was it, even at this time would be a massively substantial number. Connor Murphy was there. We started together. And then there were others. And I see they're here. Andrew Power, Nicola Brennan. I think you were there already before, before us. But there was quite a number who started at that time and it meant that there was a real community for the PhD students and it's probably only with hindsight I realized that was actually quite rare to have such a number of people supporting each other massively through the research and also having quite a, a bit of fun as well thankfully. Um, in terms of external collaborations for my own research I felt again with hindsight you look back and see how fortunate um, we were, we would work so closely with the Central Statistics Office, for example, on trying to on trying to apply data. And I can see that that was the origins of NERSA and then later um, AERO, the All-Ireland Research Observatory, where we were, I remember we'd get in the post CDs with our, our small area population statistics, and we're getting them smashed and damaged and having to ask them to be sent again. And it was, a, and again, it was just, it was, I keep, I, this is what I get very excited about census data, but it was quite exciting to get that, that and work directly with the, the CSO to actually develop definitions, in my case, developing a definition for a one-off house, which is now the formally uh, official de definition of a one-off house. Um, also, I remember when the NCG was established, it was a very, that was also very good. And us in the geography department who may not have been directly involved with that benefited massively in terms of the GIS and spatial analysis that was going on. And so we could collaborate quite well. And it felt like a very, very supportive environment at all times. And obviously you had your core group of people. I, in my case, had two supervisors, Jim and Paddy. But it was also very supportive in terms of all the other staff. I can remember sometimes going up to Mary Wells' office and in the post boxes, I'd find an article and John Sweeney would have written a little note to say, saw this article and thought you might like it. And just getting that sense of feeling that even though research mightn't have been directly related, there was always conversation around everyone's research and interest in it. And finally, I suppose for me, I remember a lot of fun. I do have some photographs, which I've sent to, to a couple of people. I don't know if they're going to be shared or not. So not too incriminating. But, you know, there was the Kildare room was a very a positive place to be in. You were a PhD student, but you were welcomed in like a colleague. And the conversations in that room were always, they were hit and miss sometimes, but some, most of the time, a lot of fun. Um, and that, that collegiality and that support continued. And I still feel that. I went to Queen's in 2005 to start working there. And I still always felt that support from the Sorry, Karen, still... I'm going to have to. Okay, thank you. I have to nudge you, you up. Sorry. Much. Sorry, Karen. It's hard uh, to not, it's hard. You start remembering it. <laughs> I know, I know. It's difficult, yeah. Sorry, Steph, do you want to come, come in? Yeah, and... Um... Thank you uh, as well for inviting me uh, today. It's lovely to see so many faces, familiar faces, and also just looking down the attendees list, lovely to see um, so many familiar names as well. And I feel like I'll be echoing a lot of what Karen spoke about and about that kind of collegiality piece and really thinking, you know, Rob, I know you asked us to kind of have a think about, um, you know, our experience as a graduate and also you know, how that shaped our career afterwards. And um, I would have probably come into the department as an undergraduate back maybe in around 2005 um, and did a brief period uh, on Erasmus. Um, and I guess during Erasmus, I had learned a little bit about, I took, undertook some modules in climate change. And I was just so excited to learn when I came back to do my final year that they had been 
doing a master's in climate change with your good self, Connor. And um, kind of right away going into my final year, I knew, well, that's that's exactly where I want to be. I want to do the master's. Um, and uh, that was kind of the trajectory all along. And that subsequently, I guess, led me into my PhD under the supervision of, of Rowan Feely and Gerald, I see uh, on as well. And um, I guess as well, just, just to echo everything that, that Karen had said about the collegiality, about the support, um, I've kind of very fond memories of Icarus, of the, of the geography department, of our uh, Thursday seminar series, uh, uh, followed by the, the appointment, obviously, in the roost for the few drinks afterwards. Um, and really something that you'd kind of look around and say, well, where are all the other departments? I wondered, do they actually have what we have? And um, I think in a lot of cases, they probably didn't. And the same with that coffee, the coffee morning, um, you know, exchanging ideas, whether it was, will you have a look at these slides? Will you have a look at this paper? There was always that sense of uh, continued support, um, whether it was preparing for, you know, the conference virus geographers every year, we always um, look forward to that as PhD students, especially. Um, and it, it was always a, an opportunity to, to see people from other unis doing their PhDs in, or in other geography departments. Um, and we always had that support from the from the geography department, you know, go there, you know, make a presentation and, you know, um, they, they would have um, helped kind of, kind of fund that. Um, and yeah, and I guess going back to, I remember it, around that 2010, 2011 period, Maynooth University had begun these kind of very fancy marketing campaigns. And it was, oh, this is the university with the open door kind of policy. And I often remember it. Um, and uh, John Sweeney, you you had been invited onto radio shows throughout your career and rightly so to speak about climate change. And I often remember my dad ringing me or texting me saying, Professor John Sweeney, he's on the radio speaking about X, Y, or Z. And I remember picking up my phone going, dad, he's in the office next to me. His door's open. I can, I'm fortunate enough to be able to converse with, with John and all of my colleagues. It doesn't, it didn't matter if you were a professor, a PhD student, you know, an undergrad you know, we really were open door uh, and that was across the board in, in the Department of Geography. Um, and, and I do wonder, do, do other departments maybe have that same um, uh, sense of collegiality and uh, togetherness, I guess. Um, uh, one or two other things that I'd love to have cameras on for some of this so I can see people's reaction when I bring up that uh, what Roe had spoke about, the graduate research uh, programme. And I remember the moans and groans that Mary Gill Martin, God love her, probably got from all of us PhD students when um, uh, we were given, oh, you have to do all of these modules um, uh, throughout your PhD. And Maynooth uh, had set kind of university guidelines and really geography were setting the bar higher. They said, no, you've got to do more. And as I said, we moaned and groaned about this. Um, and it's really only upon reflection and younger Stephanie would not agree with me here, but upon reflection, it was really geography were had really the foresight that possibly other departments didn't have at the time. And that was every PhD student that comes out of, of, of geography wouldn't necessarily go into an academic um, uh, uh, career. And really, it was their way of preparing us um, and building our resilience and our skill set for other potential avenues. Um, so I do, I, I know that kind of did stand to me because as, as it happened, leaving um, my PhD, I was able and I kind of had the confidence to make that decision quite early on that although I loved research, I wasn't going to pursue a strictly academic um, uh, career. But I, I think a lot of that kind of training and, and forcing you out of your comfort uh, zone um, throughout those graduate research mod modules did stand um, uh, to many of us, I think, um, because I know, especially nowadays, the vast majority of, of PhDs won't, won't necessarily pursue academia. But um, yeah, no, I just thought that was something um, uh, that I had reflected on the, that, um, Mary, you were right all along is what I'll say to you there. Um, and again, just kind of drawing you know, on, on undergraduate experiences as well, I remember having an essay title um, about why geography matters and kind of scratching my head going, God, it's just so open. Like, how am I going to um, go about this essay? And at the time, I, you know, I was and still am very interested in climate change. And I remember saying, oh, well, you know, I'll put a bit of a steer on this. You know, it's geography matters in terms of climate change impacts and so forth. And 
But when I think about that nearly 10 years later, we've come full circle. I work on the Training Eye Project, which Gerald Mills and Raymond Feely here um, uh, are involved in as, as co-PIs. And really it's why geography matters in terms of it's about climate change, it's about climate change mitigation. And, and going back um, to Helen's point earlier on about you know, geography is really about the human and environment interactions. And that's really what I work in nowadays with training on. It's about how uh, can we uh, reduce carbon emissions um, and make maybe more geographically refined uh, policies. Um, Sorry, Steph, I'm going to have to ask you to types. wind up as well. Perfect. No, that was that was what I was going to finish on. But effectively, it's geography matters. <laughs> yeah, you're great. And just a reminder, you're teaching on the GREP in January. I think <laughs> yes, <and 19th>. I <laughs> Thank you. I'll pass it on to uh, Derek now, who, who did his undergraduate degree and to, uh, originally from just down the road in Leak Slip. Thanks, Rob. And um, thanks so much for the invitation to, to participate in this event. And it's real, um, it's real shame not, not to be able to join you in person. And there's probably going to be some repetition. Um, and, and Rob also suggested I frame these comments in terms of an international perspective. Um, but I wanted to begin um, with, with uh, an emphasis on something a bit more situated and, and, and the local. Um, because for me, um, uh, the geography department in Maynooth was very much my local geography department. And the Maynooth was my local university because, as Rob um, uh, and noted, I grew up in Leakslip, um, where my parents still live and, and where I would have stayed if this event had been in person and where I would have looked in the attic for um, field trip photos, perhaps. Um, and and uh, also stress the local because my brother also did a degree, uh, a geography degree in Maynooth, um, but he had the good sense to go into the fashion, the fashion industry, um, which is a, a lot more lucrative and it's kind of business class uh, field trips. So I was a little bit envious about that. Um, I came to Maynooth via DCU, where it had a kind of disenchanting encounter with analytical chemistry um, and Intel, where I continued to work during my first year of, of the degree. Um, but, but geography, uh, studying geography at Maynooth definitely restored my faith in university and, and kind of allowed me to put Intel in its place, um, if only metaphorically. And I learned from Crunchius um, about the wider geographies in which Intel could be situated um, and the global processes indeed that were shaping my hometown. And uh, Francesca's lectures were just one of, of many influences. Others in no particular order included a um, uh, uh, teaching by Jim Walsh, Sheila Waddington, Kathleen Quinlan, who I think marked my first ever essay, uh, Ivan de Villi, Jacinta Pronti, Dennis Pringle, John Sweeney, and Paul Gibson. Paddy Duffy's uh, course on geography and philosophy was particularly influential and indeed enjoyable. Um, and it probably opened up a kind of wormhole for me in which to think about uh, theories of space. Um, I'd also mentioned Brendan Bartley's teaching on urban geography, which made a, a big impression, particularly uh, uh, about how Dublin was being reshaped by a range of different forces. And, and it also struck me that there were some great synergies between geography and sociology. So Mary Corcoran's lectures on media and Eamon Slater's lectures on the sociology of landscape um, stand out. Um, there were some brilliant field trips, the Geography Society, Milieu, which I note is a kind of um, fascinating archive of potential embarrassment, um, but uh, a, a, a different kind of wormhole into which I disappeared for a long, uh, a long stretch of yesterday afternoon. Um, and there were classes by international visitors, uh, including uh, Lovemore Zinyama, Gunter Gad, and others. And I remember Gunter trying to convince me not to be seduced by the postmodern temptations of Virginia Tech, um, where, where I actually ended up. Um, my advisor there was Jared Toll, who I think is one of the uh, attendees here today. Um, also has some publications in Milieu, if anybody's interested. Um, so hello, Jared, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shame not to be able to see you in person. Um, John touched on this earlier, but, but I definitely had a sense that, um, and this was in the mid 90s, I, I, I left in 95, that you had to go abroad um, to do postgraduate work. Um, and I don't remember there being a, a, a large postgraduate community, it was this expectation. But, but I sense that um, I was probably one of the last uh, uh, um, generations of students who sort of had that expectation. Um, and I also looked on the, the website yesterday to see how many PhD students have graduated from Newth, and it's a real indicator of, of uh, the kind of strength of the department. 
So as um, others have noted, maybe this is the kind of international perspective bit, um, Maynooth geography is really a, a major center of, of um, research of international significance and impact. And I think in human geography, at least the area on which I can comment, it's especially well known for combining a critical and, and also a creative commitment to spatial justice with um, expertise in understanding spatial data in all its guises, um, whether that data is generated by digital devices or even by dance. Um, and there's lots of ways in which to, to gauge the influence of the department. Uh, one way is to look at your reading lists um, and, and a cursory glance reveals the prominence of you know, Rob's work on smart cities, digital geography, Karen Till's work on memory in the city, Jerry Kearns is writing on the contested history of geography, which had a particular um, influence on debates within my own department about um, the renaming of lecture theatres after a certain Halford McKinder. Um, there's also uh, um, the significance of people who edit journals that are important in your field, social and cultural geography, which has been edited by Mary Gilmartin and, and obviously before that Rob. Um, and, and also the influence of emerging ideas. Um, and I think here of um, Ronan Foley's work on, on, on uh, blue spaces or blue geographies and Patrick Bresnahan's work on data extractivism, which is really kind of fascinating in terms of opening up uh, the contested experience and matter of the elements. And then the, the, the final way of gauging the influence is something that I think um, Stephanie mentioned, and it's to think about the voices you hear on the media. So I listen to Irish radio pretty much every day. And I've always been impressed by the number of times I've heard people from the department providing expert commentary on national media about a range of um, economic, electoral, social, uh, and political issues. Um, and in a real sense, those, those voices have allowed me to make sense of, of, of what's going on at home. Um, so I've been very grateful for that and also impressed. And like Stephanie, my parents also tell me whenever they hear John Sweeney on the radio, and they do that <laughs> on a regular basis. So um, just to conclude, uh, studying geography at Maynooth was a run wonderfully enjoyable and, and enriching and, and, and formative experience for me. Um, I'm um, grateful to those uh, people who taught me and, and um, I congratulate everyone else who's involved in the uh, ongoing development of the department and just wish everybody happy birthday and, and thanks for inviting me to participate today. That's brilliant, thanks, thanks Derek. It was a, a great commentary on, on the place. I'm gonna pass over to straight away to Kana who uh, I guess has been right the way through, so. Thanks, Rob. Um, I think everybody, it seems, has a story of bumping into John Sweeney on the radio. I once went on holidays somewhere in Spain and walked into an Irish bar and there he was on television. So there really is no escaping him. Um, my story, as you say, with Maynooth University goes back to the very beginning of my, my academic experience as a, a first year undergraduate. But even before that, um, I started university life uh, uh, in Sligo doing a degree in environmental science and became a little bit disillusioned with it quite early on. And I always remember passing uh, Maynooth train station on the way to Sligo, always thinking, why didn't I go to Maynooth to do geography? I had um, a wonderful secondary school teacher uh, who really engaged and embraced my interest in geography and always encouraged me to go to Maynooth. So I eventually took that decision, packed in in Sligo and uh, took up um, geography studies at Maynooth University and have really never looked back. Uh, that was in 1999. Um, and it's been a really uh, enjoyable task to think back over that experience and what memories really stand out for, for me as uh, a member of the department in different guises. At the graduate level, um, coming into a big department at that stage with large classes, I was very struck immediately about the sense of community, even among large undergraduate groups and in the geography department. I have memory very clearly of being very much engaged in tutorials at undergraduate level and encouraged to speak and encouraged to give ideas and, and opinions and to question what we were reading uh, and really encouraging critical insight from a very early stage. I think it was Ian Moore, if I remember correctly, who was my, my first year tutor and that role of postgraduate students in terms of encouraging our undergraduate students and that linkage between the different, the different levels of, uh, of learning in the, in the department was really wonderful. The field trips stand out, uh, I agree. I think it was, um, was it Karen or perhaps Ro who said in the previous session, we don't get to do enough of them anymore. 
I remember uh, taking field trips with John Sweeney and Jim Walsh. We try to make field trips immersive, but uh, really this is incredible from the moment you step on a bus on a Friday afternoon in Maynooth, uh, going to Clare and all the way back. It was uh, an impressive tour de force constantly, only stopping to sleep from, from John and Jim and indeed Sheila at times as well. Our local field trips uh, with Paddy Duffy, I always remember Paddy bringing us out to Castletown Estate, uh, talking to us about the history of the estate and Connolly's folly there. And that continues to come up in my own work, uh, built during Glean on Air for, uh, for community work during times of hardship and a particularly unusually cold period in our history. Um, I always reflect back on the quality of teaching that we got. Um, I don't think I ever missed a class from Roe Charlton or John Sweeney's classes, uh, despite the many hundreds of slides being able to keep up and impart a very uh, important take home messages. And they really formed uh, my interest during my undergraduate years. I knew very clearly by the time I got to third year that environment and climate was, was something that I wanted to pursue more seriously. I then went on and took up a, a master's position uh, environmental resource management and even at that stage um, the generosity of staff was remarkable. I remember doing my master's thesis on a redundant landfill site in Wexford with um, Paul Gibson who took upon himself to, to take equipment from uh, around about Enfield, drive down to Wexford in the early morning to help with uh, doing field work uh, which is it's really a remarkable commitment to students. Since then, about 2007, I've become a staff member in the Department of Geography, and oftentimes you hear people saying, well, why didn't you leave? Why didn't you go somewhere else? I've always had everything I've needed to, to grow, to mature, um, and to, to really do cutting edge research here at Maynooth University. It is, without doubt, the best place for me to do what I do, and I can't imagine being anywhere else. And I look back in terms of, you know, what informs what I do and how I try to do it. And it's really the values that I've picked up as being a, a member of Minute's community over the years that shape most of everything that I do in trying to be supportive, in being collegiate, having fun, um, and really trying to create that sense of community. And, and uh, Karen mentioned it, that these were keywords for her. I jotted down keywords and they're the exact same keywords. And it's really telling that we have a number of members of staff that are in my position. Adrian, who's come from undergraduate through Ron Feely, uh, Martina Roach. Um, I'm sorry if I missed anybody else, but that says a lot about the, the environment, the supportive nature, and the encouragement throughout. And indeed, the, the giants that we, the giants of our field that we had the privilege to, to work with over that time, from the speaker we, speakers we've had on our first panel today, um, through to others who are in the audience, it, it really has been a privilege to be part of this community. And I've seen as well over the last number of years some challenges that have been presented to us. Uh, Ro mentioned our loss of institutional memory or departmental memory around the 2008 period. Um, but we have gotten through that with our support, with, with strong leadership from uh, our various heads of departments over the years, to the massive growth that's happened in our student numbers um, and in the, the research that we do across the department. I mean, that we now have a postdoctoral community that's growing exponentially. Um, and it's, that's a community that we haven't had before, that we're getting used to We've been going beyond the PhD to thinking more about a wider postdoctoral community. We have, for example, even just in Icarus at the moment, I think 50 researchers all focused on the topic of climate. And that, that's a huge development over a pretty short period of time. And I think we've dealt well with that growth. Uh, obviously it presents challenges, but I think the resilience and commitment of staff have, have seen us overcome those hurdles. And are still doing as we're sitting here in our in our offices, our, our living rooms, our apartments, wherever we are. But the last two years have been a huge challenge. And it really is a credit to our, our students, uh, to our staff, to their resilience and their, I guess, buy-in to being part of the geography community that's seeing us through that. And we will get back in person in the not too distant future, I'm sure. So I hope I'm the first to keep the time Rob, or Derek did too. Yeah, I think you probably were. <laughs> well, it's great to hear everybody, you know, have a conversation about uh, about things. It's, it's it's tempting to try and stop you to bring other people in, but like it's just great to actually hear everybody's story and memories and so on. I think we are kind of quite up against uh, time for the end of this session, so 
I, I'm not I'm actually not really going to try and bring anybody else in at this stage. I just go go to the go to the at the break where there's going to kind of be a slideshow and so on. I think my, my, one of my favourite memories from a field trip before we talk about field trips was um, was Rowan Feely actually giving Jim Walsh a gobstopper at, at Killaloo in an effort to try and get the endless commentary to, to stop. It was quite a funny, funny moment. Um, OK, great. So I think what we're going to do is, is we are going to, to, to take a short break to let people go and get a cup of tea or coffee or... Um, uh, toilet break and so on and then we'll, we'll re resume at uh, half past three and um, there'll kind of be a short kind of slideshow thing kind of playing in a minute with some kind of photos and other information about what people are up to uh, and so on so I think Anne you're going to start that process is that right but otherwise we'll see you back in kind of 10-15 minutes uh, time and thanks very much to everybody who spoke so to to Paddy, to John, to Rao, uh, Karen, Steph, Derek, and uh, and Connor, it was really great, and we we're really sorry we couldn't get more people, and it's a shame we can't meet in person to carry on the kind of conversations over over some uh, tea and biscuits. Okay, great. Thanks very much for attending the first session. We'll see you in a in a short while.
Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome back uh, from the break. Uh, for those of you that haven't uh, met me, my name is uh, Lisa Orr, and I'm a uh, physical geography lecturer um, in the department uh, where I've been for the last uh, three years. Um, the final panel discussion that we're going to have is going to be about uh, geography and the next uh, 50 years. So looking to the future uh, for the department, uh, but also looking to the future for what geography as a discipline uh, might, might be uh, over the next 50 years. Uh, so we've got uh, six panel members in this session, and it's going to be uh, around 45 minutes long. Um, so I ask the, uh, the panel to speak for five minutes each, and then hopefully there's going to be some questions um, or time for questions at the end as well. Um, if you do have a question, I'll just uh, remind you, there is a, a button at the bottom that says Q&A, so you can put your questions in there uh, to draw them uh, to my attention. Um, and another reminder is that at the end of uh, today's uh, event, we're going to be raising a glass uh, to the main East geography. So if you uh, want to get a glass of wine or uh, mulled wine or tea or whatever it is you'd like, um, please do that kind of during the next half an hour or so. Um, so the first speaker is, is one that many of you will know. It's uh, Professor Mark Boyle. Um, so he's a professor in human geography uh, within the department, and he was once upon a time uh, head of department. Um, his research is on the politics of urban and regional development, migration and development, and uh, Western hegemony, uh, colonial and post-colonial geographies. So uh, thank you, uh, Mark, for agreeing to be the first uh, panellist. I'll uh, pass over to you, and I'm sorry if I have to interrupt uh, after five minutes or so. Thank you, Lisa. I'll try and I'll try and keep it to, to five. So, yeah, I've got a difficult job of um, reflecting upon the future, and in some ways, it's easier to look back at the past and marvel about the achievements of the department to come from nothing to what is a genuinely um, international uh, uh, research centre, centre for teaching and learning within geography. Um, um, so. Uh, uh, the journey we've been on has led us to a very strong place and the question is where do we go from here well the reason we got to where we are of course is the skill set of the founders of the department and i've uh, gone back and reflected really on what they bring to bear and all of them Paddy, jim Pranchias, john sheila dennis seamus uh, paul and of course the absolute boss uh, uh, mary weld who as we all know was the boss of the uh, department. I hope you're there, Mary. Um, all of them played a key role in building something up, but building something up and then taking it on uh, uh, another level, a step change again, is two different skill sets, two different uh, questions. And you see these company owners who set up companies and then uh, they say it's, it's one skill set to set the company up, it's quite another to take the company to the next level, especially when it's doing well. And to me, uh, here, the figure of Rob Kitchen um, comes to the fore. Um, I, I don't know, I think it was Paddy that probably hired Rob, but Rob has to be one of the most impactful uh, of any hires that any Department of Geography uh, has made. And Rob had that ability to take what was already uh, a great project in the building and to take it to the next level. And so in many ways, it depends on the gear the gear changers like Rob and whether uh, the rest of us have that capacity for gear changing uh, is, is where our future is going to lie. Now, in between uh, uh, well, 305 with Adrian Kavanagh, the history and philosophy of geography, in between the rap sessions and, you know, the, the, the kind of nonsense that we normally uh, do, we do teach some history of, of geography. And there's no doubt that at various points in the past, geography has had its moment. The, late 19th century, the mid 20th century. And I think this moment feels very much like that um, at present, which gives me great optimism, great cause for optimism, that the gear changers in the department are actually rowing with the tide. And uh, if we ride with the tide, then we're going to be in a very strong position to jump on the coattails of what is a really outstanding opportunity for geography. I think the uh, ability to speak to some of the great challenges of the 21st century is uh, incredible, which is so well placed. 
whether it's spatial inequality and uh, regional development, uh, whether it's uh, spatial justice, whether it's climate and ecological uh, crisis, whether it's place and culture and populism, uh, uh, racism, these are all big issues and our ability, we are well poised and as a discipline, but particularly as a department, uh, we have considerable strengths, I think, to, uh, to build upon. I think we also have that ability to traverse the sciences, natural sciences, social sciences, humanities. Um, when I was at Liverpool, uh, I was, it was amazing how many departments still had a, a sense of, um, you know, departmental uh, chauvinism and their multidisciplinarity, our ability to roam, I think, is, is key. Uh, you need that interdisciplinarity to solve the problems that were just uh, mentioned, <clears throat> and uh, we offer that. You have other departments that are essentially trying to sell a, a black and white analog TV in the, the digital age. Uh, we are not, fortunately. And finally, uh, spatial analytics, uh, data science, geocomputation. I mean, these are unbelievably good skill sets to have at our disposal. And as we move into a, the fourth industrial revolution or uh, whatever one wants to call the emerging labour market and the workforce of tomorrow, our ability to uh, promote tech for good and to promote uh, the use of artificial intelligence, as Rowan um, and Timber are doing, automation, uh, digital technologies, Rob, spatial data science, Chris's, the NCG. I mean, we are, we've got a superb skill set to bequeath the students to make them competitive in the, the, the job market. So our, our substantive concerns, our capacity to lead into inter interdisciplinary teams and our uh, ability to contribute to tech for good, I think gives us a unique opportunity in the 21st century. No doubt something special happened at Minuth. We're very lucky that we're all part of it and we have a duty of care now to ensure that what we've inherited, we pass on. It's time for uh, a new skill set. It's the, the time for the gear changers uh, to take what the founders have created and to move it on to the next level. And how great it would be if those celebrating the department centenary in 2071 judged all of us that were here in the 50th and were looking back over this and said that they were wise custodians and they were able to uh, take something that was already special and polish the jewel even more. Lisa, I'll leave it there. That was perfect. Thank you, Mark. Um, our second speaker today is uh, Professor Chris Brunson, again, someone who many of you will know. Um, so Chris is a professor of geocomputation and director of the National Centre for Geocomputation. Um, his research interests are in spatial statistics, data science and spatial analysis. Um, he's also very skilled in uh, the R programming language, which he uh, luckily teaches to our master's students. Um, and it's also, I think, uh, important to acknowledge Chris's work during the pandemic, uh, where he has been part of the Irish Epidemiological Modelling Advisory Group uh, to the National Public Health Emergency Team. Uh, so this has been um, really important work as well. So thank you, uh, Chris. Um, I'll just uh, pass over to you now. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Um, so um, I guess uh, a bit my role here is to think about the future of uh, spatial data analysis, and in particular, Manis Geography and the National Centre for Geocomputation's uh, role in that. And I think I should start by pointing out that whatever tra trajectory we have in the future, that is a continuation of the trajectory that we've been following up to this point. Um, without this, there would be no next 50 years or whatever. Um, and of course, uh, as we said, you know, a lot of the origin of the NCG comes from geography. And um, we've been working a lot with many academics in geography over the, uh, the, the last uh, two decades since the, uh, the NCG, um, uh, so the last decade or so since the NCG uh, started up. Um, and, uh, you know, I particularly like to thank a number of our colleagues in geography who've been uh, great uh, working with, uh, including uh, Professor Jan Rigby, who I think we've, uh, we've really, you know, done some great work together, uh, Dr. Ronan Foley, and Dr. Cahalane, Connor Cahalane, who um, was part of the NCD before uh, joining uh, the geography as a member of academic stuff. Um, I apologize if I missed anyone out. That's uh, entirely down to my lack of memory uh, rather than anything else, for my, uh, and, and of course, time constraints, but it's uh, been great. And um, of course, should also point out that uh, we also can't consider that uh, sort of trajectory without thinking about uh, our friend and colleague, Dr. Martin Charlton, 
I think he made a massive contribution to the NCD and to his geography, not just in terms of his uh, intellectual contribution, which was massive, but also his social contribution and his wits. I think we all uh, miss him uh, terribly. And uh, well, may he rest in peace, but I'm sure his ideas and influence will live on into our future. So what of that uh, future? Well, um, I think one of the things that, uh, as uh, Lisa mentioned, uh, I'm interested in looking at coding and writing code in, say, pro uh, programming language like R and Python. And I think there has been a bit of a swing towards that in working with uh, geographical information. And um, there has been perhaps, if you like, a, a, almost, a, I was going to say a term, it's almost a return to coding solutions directly. Um, and there's a number of reasons you might do that using R and uh, Python. One of which is flexibility. It gives you the possibility to develop new approaches to uh, problems rather than just trying to use an off-the-shelf uh, solution. And the other is uh, reproducibility and openness, the fact that um, when we actually make our, write our code and make it public, it makes us very open to scrutiny and to, um, to, to debate because we can, we can actually see how we've gone about things. Um, uh, when I say using R, we could also use another programming language, Python. And um, part of the reason I'm mentioning that is uh, one of our colleagues in, in geography, uh, Dr. Dennis Pringle, now uh, retired, of course, has uh, written a book about Python in 20, 2012. So uh, his prescience there, uh, long before the turn towards coding happened, is, is worth, uh, worth noting also. Um, and so I think, uh, therefore, um, I talked a bit about flexibility. And one of the reasons I think that's important is perhaps initially there was a tendency for um, quantitative geography, geographical data analysis and so forth to be something of a, um, a sort of a passage of ideas from data analysis to just come into geography and to say, well, adopt these methods and just use those. Whereas I think it should be more of a dialogue. And that's one of the reasons why the flexibility is important. If geographers can um, make uh, contributions to the debate of what methods should be used and why they would be useful and what kind of questions that uh, we want to answer, then the geographers need to have a say in that as well. And that's why we need the, the flexibility to be able to address uh, questions that uh, geographers care about. So, um, you know, I would like to think that uh, this um, it, it multidisciplinarity is moving on towards one in which um, the geography actually informs the, uh, the technical methodology and the, the, the mathematical and the data analysis methodology and not just the, the other way around. And I think that's very much beginning to happen. And I think there are great examples of that, uh, that happening in, uh, in Menuth uh, because, uh, for example, um, there's uh, people in the NCG involved in teaching uh, on the, uh, the climate change uh, MSc program and, of course, in the, the, the GIS uh, remote sensing MSc program. In addition, I think, uh, you know, that there are um, contributions made by ourselves as geographers into uh, other, um, other MSc programs outside of the geography department. So, for example, um, the uh, spatial uh, data analysis techniques and critical data studies are taught by uh, myself and by Rob in the uh, external data science masters. So we're contributing to disciplines in terms of teaching uh, inside and outside of our discipline. And uh, also in the new, uh, well, sort of revamped uh, geocomputation at MSc, which is uh, with ge uh, an MSc in, ge in spatial data science, under the guidance of uh, our newest member of staff in the NCG, uh, to Kevin credit, so uh, we look forward to seeing that, uh, that develop as well. And as I say, I think um, the other thing is perhaps that we're um, looking at a more holistic view. So we also want to think uh, critically about data science and not just think about the, the techniques, but things like questions such as, um, you know, if we are studying a certain thing, why was there a need to study that? Uh, how reliable is the data? If the data isn't reliable and the, the actual whole way that the thing is set up isn't reliable, what might be the consequences for that? How might that impinge on policy? And I think we need to think about that as well as just the, the mechanisms of the, uh, of the data science. And I think that's something that um, here at uh, many we will be developing in, um, in future years. And I think that's something that's going to be a broader debate in spatial data analysis. And um, well, it's something that we are well equipped to, to deal with here. I see a lot of colleagues contributing starting to use R in uh, areas rather than just the modules about teaching these techniques, it's starting to appear 
in other things as well, and also other kinds of uh, spatial analysis technology, such as um, uh, just, uh, GIS systems and so forth. Um, and also, you know, we have called a role in the development of uh, certain uh, spatial analysis techniques, perhaps uh, geographically weighted regression that springs to mind there for those of you who are interested in that sort of stuff. So what I think is that um, there are going to be a lot of interesting debates uh, in the link between geography and data analysis in the coming years. And I think maybe this is going to actively participate in those, the geography department as a whole. But I think perhaps not only are they going to participate, they're going to have to interrupt you there, sorry, the please. Okay, I've got three more words. Um, <laughs> um, and that's uh, just to say that um, I think that uh, maybe this would be um, not just one of the contributors to that debate, but actually, uh, you know, one of the leaders, one of the thought bearers in that, and they're going to drive that debate. And I look forward to that happening. Thank you uh, very much for those insights, Chris. Um, okay, our next speaker is going to be uh, Louise Sarsfield uh, Collins. Um, so uh, welcome to her and thank you uh, for coming uh, to join the panel. So Louise is doing her PhD at Maynooth. Um, she started off by doing her degree in geography, planning and environmental policy at UCD, uh, where she was awarded a first. Uh, and then she did two um, excellent masters um, at uh, UCD again and at Trinity. Um, she's also done some applied research posts, uh, including time with the Irish Red Cross uh, and with the Irish uh, Refugee Council. Um, and at Maynooth, she's nearing completion of her PhD now. Um, and it's about post-colonial legal geographies of sexuality in South Africa. And it's uh, funded by the IRC. Um, so we're very glad that uh, we've got you here to speak to us today. Um, over to you, Louise. Thanks for that, Lisa. Um, yeah, it's, um, so firstly, I just wanted to thank Mary and the other organisers um, of the this afternoon's event for inviting me to speak. It's, it's a real honour to be part of today's celebration of such a great department um, and a place that's you know, really become home over the last few years. Karen mentioned earlier that real sense of community among PhD students when she was at Maynooth. And, while COVID has definitely made it difficult over the last 18 to months to two years, that sense of collegiality among both uh, PhD students and generally just in the department, I think is still very much evident. And we still have those open doors um, that Stephanie mentioned, albeit they're now, um, it's more likely to be a chat on Microsoft Teams um, than a, a physical door in the department. So on this panel, we're asked to speak about the next 50 years, which, you know, it's a tough one without a crystal ball. Um, but even if we can't be sure exactly of where the next few decades take, take us, I think there's already signs of potential trajectories and that the discipline might follow and that Maynooth will be part of, and I'm sure it will be at the forefront of in Ireland and further afield. So given the context of my research, Mary asked me to think a little bit about international research when preparing for today. Um, and you know, since the beginnings of the discipline, us geographers have gone out there and explored the world, not always in the most appropriate ways, that's for sure. But you know, we were out there and now we're faced with the challenge of in the short term, COVID pandemic, uh, restrictions on travel, but also in the longer term by the climate crisis. Um, and as a discipline, we're acutely aware of the human environment connections. We know action is needed to curb climate change. We know that air travel and Indeed, road travel contributes significantly to CO2 emissions. And yet we, you know, we largely continue to travel for, for big international conferences, for field work, and, and so on. Even the ways in which early career geographers um, are encouraged to be hypermobile, and uh, you know, uh, Connor as an exception there, uh, you know, foster the need for lots of travel and, and unsustainable ways of living. Um, but you know, we can't just stay at home. Um, or rather we could, but it's not really a great solution because international research and collaboration is incredibly important for knowledge production and knowledge sharing. Um, I, I shared on the Jamboard how a chance conversation with Sheila in the Kundarium led me to meeting a contact of hers in South Africa for a coffee when I was doing my field work, which in turn led to me then being hosted by University of Zona Natal um, for some of my research and collaboration with geographers there. So, you know, just kind of highlighting from my own um, career, career um, you know, th those linkages that are only made by being in the place and, and in situ. Um, and international research and the associated travel is important for maintaining and nurturing those networks, links, 
solidarities between people and places and for understanding the processes that shape both the world out there and the world in here and the connections between the two. So in preparation for today's event, I, I had a quick look at what some other geographers with more experience than myself have been saying about these issues. And I, I found an interesting article in the Professional Geographer published in July this year from um, um, Ashley Fenn, Christine Gibbs, Satyo Shahari, Joseph Holler and William G. Mosley. And in the article, they call for us to turn to a slow geography, a slow geographies in how we confront the climate crisis. They, you know, they acknowledge that the simplest solution is to join the no-fly movement, but they also acknowledge that there you know, remains that important, um, that important place for place-based research that, that I mentioned. And, you know, our institutions are not always based in the places that we want to or that we feel we should be conducting research. Um, so cognizant that international travel for research is valuable, they suggest, you know, slowing down travel while in country, taking longer trips rather than several short trips and, you know, through the establishment of networks and partners in the field, limiting travel so that research partners can do the bulk of the field work. And of course, there are many ways that this could all be done really badly um, and serve to, you know, further marginalise groups that are traditionally marginalised in academia, like um, women or early career academics, people of colour, um, and others who do not, ha do not have the luxury of large research budgets or no caring responsibilities or permanent jobs and, you know, not to mention potential for asymmetrical power relations with partners in the field and, you know, you could go on and on. Um, so this, but th that brings me to this idea of kind of inclusivity and the need to, I suppose, as we move forward, challenge maybe dominant power structures that exist in some of our institutions um, in geography as a discipline, but wider, wider in higher education institutions. And Fent and colleagues argue amongst other things for, as I said, this slow geographies of research and travel that serves as a form of resistance to the time space compression of neoliberal globalization. And indeed as a resistance to these ever increasing demands of productivity that become more and more unattainable for the average human. Um, and they suggest that in doing this, we should consider and indeed have a moral responsibility to consider you know, justice and equity especially when doing things like maybe developing collective plans to reduce carbon emissions as a team or as a department or, or whatever the, the context or the scale might be. Um, so I'm sure the next 50 years of geography will be interesting. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how we, as a, as a discipline who's always been so out there, um, figure out ways to, to balance, balance those ideas. And I hope that we, see a continued commitment to understanding the world around us while engaging in research and practices that serve to improve it, you know, tackle climate crisis. And as I think it was Connor mentioned, just how many people even in Maynooth alone we have working on issues around climate change. Um, and continue to make geography a welcoming discipline for all, especially at Maynooth geography. Um, so I leave it there. I, I think I've stuck to time. Um, and I hope this provides some, and that we have time um, for further discussion um, um, for the end of this session. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Louisa. That was really interesting. Um, the, the next speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Sean Harrigan, um, who is a hydroclimatologist. So Sean is a, a graduate of Maynooth. Um, he did, uh, for example, the MSc in climate change back in 2009-2010. Uh, um, and then he stayed and did a PhD at Maynooth as well, again in uh, hydroclimatology. So since leaving, he's gone on to do uh, great work, first at the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology in the UK, and now as a scientist working at the European Centre for Media mm -hmm. Weather Forecasts. Um, so I'll pass over to you, Sean, if you're there. Hello, thank you very much, Lisa, for the introduction, and thanks to Mary and everybody for the invitation. Um, it's been brilliant to see everybody again. and. Uh, to uh, hear all the stories about the beginnings and indeed we've heard many from the coffee breaks at the department and uh, and Icarus. Uh, 10 years from 2006 to 2015, I was uh, from the age of 17, my for formative years in Maynooth. So for me, it's, it's I mean, it's been the, the, the backbone of my career. It set me uh, uh, the complete foundation for what I'm doing now and all the, the ideas and colleagues and everything. And so Mary gave me the small task to try and summarize the future of climate science and geography's role in tackling that those grand challenges and i think uh, going back to what mark and chris said 
I think I'm kind of going to bring those together. So since leaving, I'm kind of, I'm now on a way out of academia and working kind of, and kind of the, the kind of more application domain where we're trying to put in practice all the great science, all the great kind of understanding of how humans interact with the planet, how we make predictions of going forward and future and all the types of tools and models and all this new, new technology coming down the line. How do we actually make that um, usable for, for actually the purpose of improving our um, kind of survival in the planet, not to sound too dramatic, but that's at the, at the state we're at. I'm thinking about the next 50 years, survival and thriving on this planet. And so for me, working in the organizations post Minuth, what was absolutely clear is um, you could very often actually tell who came from geography and who had that background, the ability to be able to have that multidisciplinary um, uh, kind of attitude, the ability to be able to open conversations, have ideas with people from different backgrounds. So we're not going to solve the problem by ourselves. It's not going to be an individual. It's not going to be to one group and one department. It's going to be across multi-community efforts to deal with this problem from both the, the, the physical science, the social science and everything in between. Um, and, that, and that's what I've been learning. And so just even thinking forward to some of the programs we're implementing at, at the European Commission. So it's one's called Destination Earth, as an example. And this will be a, probably a decade long piece of work that we're taking all the, the satellite information and the new technology from the European, European Space Agency. We're bringing all technology such as uh, artificial intelligence, um, as well as all the weather forecasting and climate models we've been working with. And we're going to already build the next generation of that. And what that next generation looks like is we are going to add the human in there. The human dimension is going to play a much more important role. So rather than we just run some computer simulations and then you know we output that and they're very complex um, models and output that nobody really understands. The idea is that, that everybody, policymakers, decision makers, and um, will have a much lower bar to be able to access that kind of amount of resources. Um, but also the fact that we're operating, you know, at the minute we're running forecasts for all sorts of extreme events current day, but with some key processes that are still missing. We don't understand exactly how humans uh, interfere with the, the hydrological cycle, for example. Um, we, when we're making predictions, we don't understand what the decisions in some of the most complex countries in the world and dealing with um, geopolitical aspects and that. So you can have all this fancy science and modeling all you want, but if you don't have that whole view, you're not going to create something that's going to be really actionable for the proper tough decisions and the policy making decisions. And as well as that, being able to actually change the tune. So rather than we run our simulation, we give you the output, it should rather be, what if we implemented this policy decision? What impact could that possibly have? And that's almost providing some scenario planning and some additional more sophisticated tools. So I think that's what the future is going to look like in terms of you know a complete next generation levels of predictability that that are, are kind of have been on scene for now but we're going to you know instead of having all different uh, um, all different kind of um domains working separately it, it's all coming together it's been it's been really recognized that that we have to all have this one type of earth view from both the physical and social sciences um it's not going to be easy but i just think for me um just working with um people there's enough specialists I think, and, and I, I think uh, John Swinney touched on it before when he mentioned about all the different things he had to te teach. I think the skill set we learned during our, our journey in geography was probably for me the most important thing. I find myself kind of looking back laughing sometimes when I'm in a meeting or I've been asked to make something and display something. And I, I of course, go to a map or something. And it's a second nature. And I just display something that makes sense to people who have to work with. You know, I could work from scientists to people on the Red Cross who's working in, you know, Uganda, you need to have that breadth. So, you know, there's enough specialists out there. And of course, everybody has their own specialities. But I really think that ability to be able to have that conversation with very many people from backgrounds to me has, has been the thing that I think we will, as a discipline, train our students, train our graduates, be able to bring forward into the workplace, not just academia. So I think my time's up. So I think that's the thing I'll leave with. Thanks. Oh, thanks very much, Sean. Um, so the, the next speaker that we have is um, Professor Harriet Hawkins. Uh, so welcome, Harriet. Um, Harriet's a professor of human geography and a co-founder and a founding co-director of 
sorry, of the Centre for Geo-Humanities at Royal Holloway. Um, her awards include a, a Philip Levy Hume Prize, uh, the Royal Geographical Society Jill Memorial Award, and most recently a five-year ERC grant as part of Horizon 2020 uh, Research and Innovation Programme. She is also the author of numerous publications, including the book uh, Four Creative Geographies. Um, and we're very glad that Harriet is also currently our external examiner for our MA in uh, Geography and Spatial Justice. Um, so welcome, um, Harriet. Sorry, I thought, I thought I was muted then. Um, I'll pass over to you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Lisa. And thanks to Mary and all the organisers for, um, for all the work you've been doing. And I'm really, truly honoured to be included today and have the opportunity to be part of these celebrations. So my comments are framed by the admiration I have for Maynooth Geography, not just the group of dedicated and inspiring geographers producing cutting edge scholarship, but also for the incredible commitment and care you bring to creating and nurturing the next generation of geographers, something that, of course, is truly important to the discipline. This is, as Lisa said, something I've had the privilege to witness at first hand through my role as an external examiner on the master's courses, but also through the privilege of, in, um, of examining several of your incredible PhD students over the years. So as much as I could say, but I think I want to draw out three of the most striking things that I think Maynooth Geography offers our wider discipline and also the world for the next 50 years and, of course, also beyond. So firstly, Maynooth Geography matters. As an academic community, we of course don't need convincing that geography matters, but it seems to me though that Maynooth geographers offer students, offer the rest of the discipline, and importantly the myriad organisations, institutions and individuals beyond the academy with whom you collaborate, a very real sense of the value of geographic knowledge and what it can do. I've been really inspired by the visual of spatial justice I see enacted across your master's teaching, where cutting edge research is embedded with collaborative staff and student work with local communities and international organisations, including the work you do with organisations like the Pave Point Traveller and Roma Centre. And I think, of course, many across the discipline and wider academy aspire to such forms of impact and engagement, but in few places that I think this so, so thoroughly shape the experience our students have as it does at Maynooth. It's important, though, to celebrate, of course, what this means for the shaping of, of critical thinkers for the next generation. Of course, also for the geography teachers that your courses increasingly create. For these are individuals who, of course, go into the world equipped not just with geographical knowledge, but the real skills to make sure that knowledge matters in the world. The second thing I want to draw out is creative interdisciplinarity. One of the things I find so inspiring about the way that you will approach your research and teaching is its openness to interdisciplinary conversations and practices. Whether this be the work on spatial analysis and all that data science might be, environmental justice, where science, social science and environmental humanities can come together, as well as your commitment to embedding creative arts practices as skills that your masters and doctoral students can really explore. Your recent exercises in spatial justice with movement artist Dr. Raj Singh is a real model for how to make space for students to think and feel geography and spatial justice differently. We're often told, of course, that interdisciplinarity is a solution for the wicked problems of our time. And I think Maynooth Geography offers us all important models for how to move beyond just nodding towards or tokenistically acknowledging the value of other ways of knowing. I admire how through the, cur your, the courage to explore interdisciplinary potentials and challenges with your students, you foster their creative inquisitiveness and promote openness to other ways of knowing and being that feels like such a crucial skill for us all today. My final point is about disciplinarity, because I think one of the things I most admire is that how at Maynooth Geography, these aspects, collaborations with groups beyond the academy, creative interdisciplinarity for challenge-led research, are not just reflective of current fashions and trends, but the expression of years of commitment from dedicated staff and inspiring PhD students, and are, and are shot through with a scholarly commitment to the discipline itself, a belief in the importance of geographical history, theory and philosophy, and the upholding and advancement of scholarly knowledge and standards. In what can seem then like an increasingly anxious academy, I think your department offers me and others a vibrant and hopeful model for how to be a geographer, both within and importantly beyond the university. Your research and teaching demonstrates how clearly, clearly how and why geography matters, and moreover imparts that to your students and others as an integral part of a geographical disposition towards the world. This combines shaping a discipline with shaping critical individuals whose scholarly integrity is thoroughly entangled with critical and ethical ways of working towards forms of environment and spatial justice. 
In this, Maynooth Geography offers me continued hope for how our discipline, alongside the communities we all collaborate with, can, in ways both large and small, for the next 50 years and beyond, continues working towards making the world a better place. Congratulations. Thank you very much, uh, Harriet. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, and finally, um, our sixth speaker is uh, Dr. Cathy Delaney. So Cathy is a senior lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan University um, and she has previously been our physical geography external examiner uh, for our department as well. So Cathy researches uh, past and present glacial systems and is an authority on lake glacial valved sediments in Irish paleoglacial lakes and on the origin of uh, glaciofluvial systems in the Irish Midlands. So Cathy is a really valued member of the Irish Quaternary Association community and she was instrumental in securing the uh, 2019 uh, International Quaternary Association Conference uh, in Dublin, which I attended and very much enjoyed. Um, and this was a huge conference with over, over 2,300 delegates. So it turned out to be uh, the largest geoscience meeting um, held in Ireland. Um, so uh, you're very welcome, uh, Cathy. I'll just pass over to you now. Thank okay, you. thanks very much, Lisa. And I'd just like to say thank you to Mary and everyone for inviting me to be part of this. I'm, I'm really do feel honoured and delighted. I've really enjoyed every time I visit visited Maynooth, um, which has been quite a lot, not just to geography. I think my first visit to Maynooth was probably shortly after the founding of the department in 1971, although not actually to see anyone in the department. Um, to understand this, this idea of 50 years is, is a kind of mind boggling. So I actually look back 50 years to see what was happening in Irish geography in 1971 to get myself some sort of balance and change. And uh, there were three articles in Irish geography that year on physical geography, uh, two of which dealt with landslides and flooding. Uh, and one of which dealt with limestone pavement. And I, I was kind of fascinated about the landslides and flooding because flooding, that's certainly not gone away. Both of those papers were written in Belfast, though, so there's been a real pivot in where the results or where the research has been done, thanks to Maynooth, um, I think, even more than any other department in Ireland. Um, the other thing was I looked at the publications for that year, and I noted in particular that there were two publications by the Irish Meteorological Office in 1971, and they were the temperature and sunshine statistics from 1931 to 1960. So 11 years later, that data was produced. And I note that there is a request in the Q&A for a forecast for 2071. We might actually have that, but there has been a really dramatic change in that sense. So maps in those days produced by hand drawing and so on, which is such an extraordinary change in terms of data availability, 11 years to pretty much instant these days, that it's almost mind boggling to think what another 50 years will do. But I would say in physical geography, that one thing is definitely not going to change. We're not going to see any change away from the climate crisis being the dominant influence on where we go and what we do. And I think Maynooth has been very aware of this, thanks to the work of John Sweeney originally, and certainly a very strong influence on me um, as a member of the Quaternary Association uh, in the 80s and 90s, um, his work in establishing Icarus and in persuading people that this was a really, really, vital issue for the safety of the planet the future of our of all our futures on the planet has been hugely influential and i think that was a really uh, from the point of view of geography Muth, was really important this department is going to be central to how we plan for the future in our how you plan for future in ireland because of course i'm sitting in manchester watching almost with envy at the moment um the geocomputation facilities are all lined up there so i think that really the global response, we can certainly say for the next five years, it's how we interact with geopolitics, uh, with societies generally is going to decide things. And whether we're going to see a continuation of a focus on, in Ireland particularly, on instability in climate affecting slope stability, landslides, all sorts of things in local environment, or whether actually things don't work out and we increasingly move towards thinking about the really big one, which of course is going to be sea level change if glacial systems continue on the path they've been set on and things get worse instead of better. And um, within that context though, I think Maynooth can contribute 
almost more than any other department in Ireland, which is, is great for Ireland, um, but a bit grim for the rest of us. Um, I was really struck as well by data, and I think a couple of people have mentioned data. And for me, I think in physical geography, one of the really big changes we're certainly seeing in the last 10 years and moving onwards into the next 10 years is both the availability of lots and lots and lots of free data. I think that's really important. And also the accessibility of data. So we're seeing a real switch in what we mean by accessibility for the physical geographer. It used to be access to a car or a plane, um, a means of transport to get to the field. But these days I find it's easier for me to do glacial geomorphology in Siberia than it is in parts of Ireland because of the availability of, of really good digital elevation models. Um, and I've put a digital elevation model as my background just to remind people of what a digital elevation model is, but these are drumlins in Monaghan um, measured at one meter intervals, the height and then hill shaded. Um, and the, the, the free availability of this data is transforming our understanding of landscape and transforming the way we can interact with it. So I think that's a really big change that Manuth is really well positioned to deal with. And also Manuth's students um, are very well positioned to actually work with. I also mentioned availability and accessibility, but what, one of the really big changes I hope we see um, and I think Connor in particular has, has, has highlighted this to me is the interaction between academics and the rest of the world. I think we're going to see a switch in physical geography to having to think about solutions and not just, just explain processes and understanding, but actually explain how you might actually use that information to manage landscapes. Um, and when that's combined with changes in modeling from globally and increasingly fine detail of models to look at local changes and, and also the development of new technologies that we can all access this stuff easily. So not just that it's there, but anybody can have a look and know about their own area. I'm hoping that we'll see a switch over the next 50 years to communities really understanding their own landscape better and taking charge of their own landscape and managing them in a way that makes sense to the people who live in it, but also allows them to be sustainable. And I think most people where they're living, they want that, that environment to be sustained and not be destroyed. So I think that could be a really powerful thing. Um, that may happen. Um, I'm not going to say anything more really because I think I'm the last speaker, except the one thing I would say are two things I'm going to say. First of all, is that Manute's biggest strength, I think, is its people. I think when I visit the department, there is a real sense of life, of energy, of thought, of stimulation, of fun all the time there. I think people are really thinking about their work, but they're also able to relax and enjoy it. And I think my final thing would be that the future, the immediate future of Maynooth, I'm very sad to say is not how it should be, which is going down the pub to continue this conversation. And um, so thank you for asking me. Thank you so much, uh, Kathy, and thank you to all of our speakers uh, in this session. Um, it's been really nice to hear uh, your thoughts. Um, we do have uh, just about one minute in case anybody would like to um, ask a question. Um, if you could like uh, put it in the chat or uh, write in the question and answer um, window. Alistair has asked uh, in the question and answer, how far will Maynooth be from the beach in 2071? Um, Hopefully not uh, too close. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to answer that. Um, okay, I think um, because uh, Jim, I Jim Walsh sorry. has Jim Walsh's hand is raised. Oh right, sorry, I'm not yeah. looking at people's hands yeah. being raised. Uh, thanks, Mary. Um, yes, yeah, so would uh, Jim like to speak now? I'm not sure if Jim can speak, sorry. Yeah, you might just have to wait a second if Anne, if Anne can get the transfer the rights to, to do so. He's just been transferred, so any moment well, now. Sorry, can, can you hear me there? Yes, I yeah. can. I, I just think that, um, um, uh, thank you for the invitation to, to uh, listen in on uh, today. It's been wonderful just reflecting back on all the uh, achievements. Um, um, I was taken by the um, comments by um, 
uh, Harriet, uh, um, towards, uh, uh, Cathy towards the end when she reflected on Irish geography in 1971. Um, uh, if, if I could just for a, a moment to say that 19, um, this is a, a 50th anniversary for me as well, and that uh, I started my career as an undergraduate exactly 50 years ago. And uh, a couple of days ago, I took the opportunity to look at what we were being taught as geographers at that time. And the most striking things that stood out for me were uh, the textbooks were all written by American geographers or a few British geographers. Uh, the, the titles were about man and the environment or mankind, man this and man that, but not a single mention of women anywhere uh, in anything we were being taught uh, at that stage. Um, so, it, uh, And the other thing was, of course, um, the geography uh, in Ireland and particularly uh, uh, starting off, we were borrowing ideas left, right and centre from the rest of the world. Today, Minute is a great exporter of ideas. Uh, it's wonderful that on the staff, we have you know, some of the most highly cited geographers uh, globally uh, who, uh, whose ideas are being picked up and used in courses uh, where we, uh, many years ago, drew inspiration from. So I just want to add those points. And lastly, I'd say, you know, the, the, the words that recurred for me throughout the afternoon were the, the importance of um, the, the, the talent in the department, the, the, the the staff, the postgraduates, the undergraduates, the quality of the teaching uh, that has been sustained through, over the years, the um, a capacity to overcome resource uh, constraints. And geography, I remember st standing out as uh, in minute as the department that had the second largest amount of research funding. I can't think of any other university where that is the case. Uh, you know, it, it was unique. But the word collegiality uh, stood out many times and uh, collegiality for me was the glue that held the department together and provided the atmosphere and the environment within which people worked and long may it last into the future. Thank you for that opportunity. Thank you for your comments. I would agree definitely about uh, the collegiality which I've enjoyed uh, over the last few years uh, as well. Um, so I would, um, I think, like to pass on now to uh, Mary, who's going to um, lead some presentations of awards and also uh, the conclusion. Okay. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Lisa. Um, we're now towards the end of this really lovely celebration of 50 years of Maynooth geography. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Mary Glenmartin. I'm a professor in the department and it's my honor to chair the final and on time session. So we're gonna start this session with uh, the announcement of some very special awards. Um, in September 2017, a new PhD student, Matt Stevens, joined our department. In a very short time, Matt became a regular and much loved presence in Rhetoric House. Um, Matt sadly and unexpectedly passed away in March 2018, and we still miss him. Matt loved geography and he loved travel. To remember Matt, we established the Matt Stevens Fund with the aim of supporting postgraduate students in the activities that Matt loved. We'd like to thank everybody who contributed to that fund. And in particular, we'd like to thank Matt's parents, Tony and Aditi Stevens. Tony and Aditi have joined us today. So thank you for being here. And thank you for helping to remember Matt in this way. And so we have two award recipients to announce today. The first award in the Matt Stevens Fund is to Louise Sarsfield Collins, who you have heard speak earlier today. Louise's award will support her full attendance at the 2022 Conference of Irish Geographers in Limerick in order to present important research on solidarity building within the legal geographies of LGBTI citizenship in South Africa, continuing to build on the strong links between Maynooth geography and geographical um, thought and investigation in South Africa. Congratulations to Louise. The second award is to Shirley Howe. Shirley's award will support ongoing field research on the effects of climate change as experienced by the people of Inishbofin and an event to present this work, including citizen generated weather maps back to the island community. In her application, Shirley wrote that this award, named for a valued member of the department, contributes to a deepening sense of community and continuity within the department, as it serves as recognition of the shared passion and commitment of all geographers to the issues that affect life on earth. Congratulations to Shirley too. So well done to both Louise and to Shirley, whose important work will also serve as a memory of Matt. And so with this, I'd like to bring the event to close, to a close with some very important thank yous. The event was made possible because of the efforts of many people. 
thanks to Helen Shaw for her support for the event. Thank you to everyone who participated by speaking today. Um, our panelists, our wonderful panelists across three sessions, um, the session chairs and the president of Maynooth University who joined us earlier on. Um, special thanks to the people who worked behind the scenes to make sure that this ran smoothly and without technical hitches, especially to Anne Hamilton Black in Mussey um, and to Mussey's support for the, uh, the platform uh, on which this was held. And also thanks to the members of the organizing committee who didn't take a public role today, but whose contributions to this event were vital. Um, Nessa Hogan, Alistair Fraser, Steve McCarran, Ronan Foley. The event would have been nothing without an audience. So thank you so much to everyone who registered, attended and participated. Thanks to our current and former students and colleagues, to our friends from the global geography community. Mila Buichis, Steve Galer. Shirley's comments about the importance of community and continuity bring to mind the beautiful words of Kentucky writer Bell Hooks, who passed away yesterday. She wrote that finding out what connects us, reveling in our differences, this is a process that brings us closer, that gives us a world of shared values, of meaningful community. As we've heard on numerous occasions, um, and importantly in these times, the people who set up this department, and the people who kept it going through those difficult years created a meaningful community together with the students who have sustained us throughout the last 50 years. Our community has prospered because of a shared commitment to decency and care for each other and for the world that we live in. As Maynooth Geography looks to the next 50 years, let's continue to revel in our differences while holding on to the importance of shared values and meaningful community. And so with that, I'd like to invite all the panelists who are with us to turn on their cameras. And I'd like to invite all of you who are in attendance to join us in raising a glass to Maynooth Geography. If you're not on camera, but you're on social media, feel free to take a selfie and post it on Twitter or Instagram. And with this, I'm going to ask you to Congratulations to Maynooth Geography and here's to the next 50 years. Thank you. And with that, we should be going to the roost, I think. Um, thank you all for being here. And I think we'll finish with the repetition of the images that we saw in the break. Some of you may have missed them. Um, thanks for being here and um, we'll have more we hope in face or in person and face-to-face -face events to mark 50 years um, after Christmas in the new year where we hope to have some new exciting announcements about the future of Maynooth Geography. Thanks everybody, thanks for being with us. <laughs>